Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today, uh, as Jasper said, two talks uh, into one. And uh, I'll start off talking about NICE guidelines for chest pain, which will just overview, hopefully, uh, refresh your memory about things that you will already know. And then where cardiac CT fits into that, because that's one of the most uh, important changes that was made to the NICE guidelines. And then I'll talk a little bit more in detail about clinical utility of cardiac CT and where that's going for the future. And in particular, some emphasis, important recent data on prognosis and outlook for patients with cardiac CT, uh, plaque characterization, which is becoming very important, and also the future, which will be uh, cardiac ischemia and stress perfusion imaging, which is uh, yet to come and something that is, is a very new technique that we're developing here at Science Clinic. So to start off with, we're going to talk about uh, uh, chest pain and uh, some of the NICE guidelines. So in the UK, this is a big problem for all, all of you in primary, uh, primary care. Uh, about 1% of all visits to a GP are because of chest pain. And this leads to a big burden uh, in the acute sector as well. 40% of emergency admissions to hospital are because of chest pain. And almost 2 million people have uh, angina or coronary artery disease. So clearly a big problem which we're all going to face in primary, secondary and tertiary care. So NICE basically suggests that we need to diagnose stable angina based on clinical assessment uh, and uh, in combination with diagnostic tests, which we'll come to a little bit later on. And the features of uh, typical angina, we must estimate the likelihood of coronary artery disease. And if it's more than 90%, when I'll show you how we estimate that, then we should treat without delaying uh, before any further tests, and we should treat for stable angina and coronary artery disease. Unless a clinical suspicion is raised, we should exclude a diagnosis of stable angina if the symptoms are not typical, if it's not angina. So how do we do this? Well, we use our traditional clinical assessment, history, examination, ECG findings, and the typicality, the features of angina, to estimate the likelihood of coronary artery disease. And from then, we decide what sort of test is required. No longer is exercise stress testing recommended, so we should not be using an exercise stress, uh, exercise stress test to diagnose de novo new uh, coronary disease in people with a recent onset chest pain. However, we do use uh, exercise stress testing uh, quite a lot, and we make, this may come up in discussion, uh, for people who have already known to have coronary artery disease, and it's still very, very useful for functional testing, so we can understand what the functional capacity is of patients, and whether uh, exercise test brings on any symptoms or arrhythmias. So there still is a key role for exercise stress testing. We must not dis uh, dismiss it completely. So what are the features of stable angina? Well, these are the typical features. Constricting discomfort in the front of the chest, neck, shoulders, jaws, or arms. Precipitated by exercise and relieved by rest or GTN. Now we use those features to uh, describe the typicality, the typical nature that we think uh, this has. So in people with non-anginal chest pain, they will have one or none of these features at all. Uh, if the uh, angina uh, is atypical, they may have two of these features. And we call this typical angina if all three of these features are present. So chest pain, precipitated by exercise, and relief by rest and GTM. So for people in whom stable angina cannot be uh, diagnosed or excluded on the basis of history, uh, a 12 lead ECG is, is required, and you've heard something about that earlier on this morning. For people with confirmed coronary artery disease, uh, we should offer a non-invasive functional test. And when there is uncertainty about that, we must think about that because that will help us to identify myocardial ischemia. So in people without confirmed coronary artery disease, we must estimate the likelihood of coronary artery disease and then recommend a diagnostic test. And this is where the change has been in the last couple of years with the new NICE guidelines. So how do we work out what the pretest probability is of coronary artery disease? Well, NICE has come up with a slightly complicated table, which uh, is not familiar to many people, but this is what we use now to work out what the pretest probability is. It means what's the likelihood of there being coronary artery disease based on the um, essential symptoms, the features of the angina. And that's why I took a little bit of time just to go through uh, why it's important to differentiate the typical, atypical, and non-anginal chest pain because that has a bearing on the pretest probability. So you can see from this table that if angina is typical, then patients are generally more likely to have uh, a higher pretest probability of coronary artery disease. 
So the other key things are that we also can split patients into high and low risk. And the high risk patients are those who have got essentially the most important risk factors, smoking, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, which I just mentioned at the bottom over here. And if you have that, then you can see that that increases your risk and that increases your pretest probability, whether you're a man or a woman, regardless of whether the, the nature of the angina is uh, non-anginal, uh, atypical, or typical angina. Now, this blue box here, over, traditionally, over sort of the last five or ten years, we normally we wouldn't have investigated this group of people. These are people who have non-anginal chest pain. We would have said, fine, this is not cardiac, off you go. Or we may have given some risk factor medication. So you can see now that this is a big change because now we are looking at uh, trying to risk stratify these people a little bit better by working out their um, uh, pretest probability and whether they're at high or low risk. And you can see that a lot of these people, as I'll show you in the next couple of slides, will, will be stratified to progress on to having further diagnostic tests. So this is another very important uh, implication of the NICE guidelines. So, when we um, work out whether we think the pretest probability is um, a low, intermediate, or a high risk, then that helps us to identify what should be the next step, what should be the next test that we should do for our patients. And this table sort of summarizes the NICE guidelines as to the recommendation for uh, the next step after identifying uh, the likelihood of disease. So, if it's a low to intermediate risk, which is this left side here, we'll just focus on that for a moment. So a pretest probability of less than 30%, 10 to 29%. And in fact, if it's less than 10%, we're said to just tell the patient, this is not cardiac and we don't need any further tests. So in specifically in this group of patients, the first thing we're meant to offer is a calcium score, okay, a CT calcium score. And that basically shows whether there's any calcification at all in any of the coronary tree. Now if that calcium score is raised, then we progress on to CT coronary angiography. And NICE recommends that if that's between 1 to 400, we should go on to a CT coronary angiogram with a, 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 one of the latest generations of a CT scanners, at least a 64 slice or better scanner, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. If the calcium score, though, is very high, so over 400, then the recommendation is to progress on to the patients who have got a higher pretest probability, so that would be invasive coronary angiography. However, um, well, well, why is that recommendation? That, that recommendation is there because when there's a lot of calcium, it can be difficult to interpret, but I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and that's why the recommendation has been to proceed onto an angiogram, which looks inside the lumen of the coronary artery. However, with the latest generation of scanners that we have, uh, particularly that we have here at Sion, for example, we are still able to give a good indication where the calcium is and what the distal vessels look like. So it could still be useful to do a CT coronary angiogram in, in this group of patients. Now, in the middle group, which you're going to hear about uh, in the next talk, the um, uh, next uh, recommendation is to do a non-invasive uh, functional imaging test. And uh, the most common practice in this country would be a stress echo. And uh, we will talk about that a little bit later on. But an alternative may be uh, a nucleus scan, a thallium scan, or a MIBI scan, or an alternative t test. So it depends on what the local expertise is as to what patients will be offered in this intermediate to high risk group. And in the higher pretest probability group, the recommendation is to progress on straight to coronary angiography. So if we have these patients presenting to a chest pain clinic, for example, what we now do is we schedule them to have coronary angiogram straight away uh, and initiate treatment. So that's a summary of the diagnostic testing that's now recommended. So you can see from there that an exercise test is no longer recommended at all. We no longer should be using chest pain clinics with an exercise test. We should be trying, to, if we're going to be nice compliant and we follow these guidelines, we should be um, uh, looking at these newer tests, and this is where CT scan comes in uh, on these lower group patients, a functional test or go straight to the cath lab. And this is a departure from traditional standard practice just a few years ago. So I'm just going to show you how this can affect local practice, and this is how uh, some data from Ealing Hospital which I'm going to share with you, which, where we audited the rapid access chest pain clinic. And just to show you what implications this has for local practice, and it can be very difficult. And we have been uh, striving to make our service uh, top quality, but also to make sure that it is compliant with NICE guidelines. And in fact, we will be only one of the, area, one of the uh, units in West London who will have a chest pain clinic that will be fully NICE compliant. And in fact, at Imperial College at the moment, where I also work, we still use exercise stress testing there. So I'm just going to go through this because this is interesting because this shows how we've changed our practice over the last 
a couple of years at Ealing. So back in uh, 2010, uh, we started, I introduced Cardiac CT there, uh, and we started um, with a business case, which we, I wrote, and we started doing CT chronyangiography and calcium scoring, just one session per week. This has rapidly, rapidly exploded into a very busy service. And at that time, our chest pain clinic wasn't nice compliant. We were still using exercise treadmill uh, testing. Then, uh, just last year, uh, we decided to audit this and have a look at the chest pain clinic and see you know, what would we need to do to become nice compliant and what steps can we take to implement these nice guidelines because it's always difficult in clinical practice to implement guidelines. So we see about 1,200 patients a year. So we're a very busy chest pain clinic and this is actually growing and growing. And uh, we did an um, audit for three months to look at well, what would be the stratification, the pretest probability of our patients. And that will help us decide how many patients do we think we would need to have a CT scan, a stress echo, or go straight to the cath lab. So that's on this top part of the next slide here. So you can see the very low, less than 10%, or just 10% of patients. In the low, intermediate, uh, low to intermediate pretest probability, that was 30% of our patients. Uh, in the intermediate group, that's 40% of our patients. And the higher pretest probability, over 60%, was 20% of our patients. So you can see that it's this group here, the CT and the stress echo uh, service, which has a very uh, big implication if you're going to run a chest pain clinic which is fully NICE compliant. So what we uh, then did is to look at, well, what would that actually mean? Well, that would mean that we would have to run one to two additional sessions per week for cardiac CT, and equally the same probably for stress echo, because we could probably do slightly more stress echo cases uh, than cardiac CT. So to implement this, uh, what is, I started uh, this year was a walk-in service for calcium scoring at Ealing Hospital. Now this has been going for the last six months and this works very well. So in fact what we do is for any patient that comes to the chest pain clinic who's in that uh, uh, low to intermediate group, we can immediately do a calcium score for our patients which is very, very helpful. Some of those patients are still getting an exercise test because that, as I said that's helpful to look at functional capacity but we now have a walk-in service for calcium scoring. And we can then schedule those patients to go on to have a CT coronary angiogram uh, at a, a planned date. So we're already doing one to two patients a day, uh, and we have been doing that over the last three months. And in addition to the, the other requirements, we're training up other staff now to be trained in cardiac CT and stress echo. And I would predict that probably towards uh, third quarter of this year, our chest pain clinic will be fully NICE compliant. So this is a way are that we have taken these NICE guidelines, we've taken them on board, we've engaged with them, we've actually now uh, audited our practice, and we will be one of the only centres in West London which will be fully NICE compliant, at least by the end of this year. So that's the uh, run through on the NICE guidelines. I'm gonna switch now to cardiac CT, and why it's useful and why it has been um, brought into the NICE guidelines, um, and uh, what its role is in diagnosis of chest pain and coronary artery disease. So the key areas where um, CT angiography and calcium scoring are useful is to actually help to stratify patients. So calcium scoring you'll be familiar with. CT uh, calcium score has been around for at least the last 10 years and has been growing in evidence base. And we know that people that have, for example, a calcium score greater than 100 compared to those with less than 100, they have an increased event rate over the next five years. So this sort of data is very important. And that is why uh, CT calcium scoring and coronary angiography has become part of the NICE guidelines. But uh, CT coronary angiogram is also very, very good at visualising the coronary anatomy, as you can see here in the middle slide. It's also very good at looking at cardiac morphology, so we can look at uh, myocardial function as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that, because we can look at wall motion quite well. And the way forward for the future is to look at ischemia and viability imaging. Uh, there are some limitations of that because that is almost like a double scan. We need to do two scans in one, so that leads to an extra uh, radiation and contrast dose. But um, with the newest scanners and the latest generation like we have here, that radiation dose is going to be quite low, and it's going to be practical to do this for some selected groups of patients. So the first thing I would say is that the clinical, one of the main clinical utilities of CT coronary angiography is because uh, it's so good at visualising the coronary arteries in, in, in uh, selected patients, uh, we are able to exclude coronary arteries. So for example, in this sort of patient, the lights are not helping us, this is an invasive angiogram on the right of a right coronary artery, and this is the CT coronary artery. Now. And you can see, almost identical, and this is normal, so this is very good at ruling out coronary artery disease. And this is why it's also very important in the NICE guidelines, because if you see this sort of image, 
uh, or someone with no calcium and, 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 and you do a CT coronary angiogram as well, you're able to rule out coronary artery disease very, very effectively. And that is uh, a, a key strength of CT coronary angiography. However, we're also very good at picking up diffuse coronary disease. Now you can see here, this is a coronary angiogram of a patient with diffuse severe left anterior descending and all the branches basically the coronary arteries are diffusely diseased on the invasive angiogram. And on the CT coronary angiogram, we will see the same thing. So it's very good at picking up coronary disease. And uh, I've put up here um, multi-detector CT competitive coronary angiography. Um, and I think that uh, uh, because the limitation of coronary angiogram is it only looks at the lumen, what we're able to see with a CT scan, a CT coronary angiogram and a calcium score, is not only are we able to see the lumen, as here, but we're also able to look at plaque. And we'll also be able to look at the position of that plaque. And as I'll show you towards the end of the talk, we're also able to look at the characteristic of that plaque. And that is becoming very important in terms of the prognosis and determining the outlook and outcome of patients. As an interventional cardiologist, it's also very, very useful to look at CT coronary angiography because it can help to plan intervention. So this is another example. Uh, for example, on a coronary angiogram, we've got a blocked right coronary artery. We actually cannot see what the distal vessel looks like. But if we use a CT coronary angiogram, we can actually see that there is a nice distal vessel here. So either this could be amenable to a bypass operation or it could be amenable to try to open up this artery Especially if we look here, there isn't much calcium. There's a little bright dot there. I don't know if you can see that from the back. But most of this is soft plaque. So we may actually be able to open up that artery. And this is a very good technique to help plan intervention. And I'm using it more and more, as are my colleagues, to help us uh, not only identify disease, but to plan the intervention ahead. And you can inform your patients very well now, because you can do a CT coronary angiogram and say, well, actually, you've got a single lesion, which I think I can open because it's soft plaque. Or you can say ahead of time, Actually, I think you've got severe three-vessel coronary artery disease and you may need a bypass operation. So we're much, much better equipped and able to inform our patients before an invasive test which has a higher risk uh, of what the outcome is likely to be. Another key strength which is growing and growing definitely in my practice is graft evaluation. So people that have had bypass surgery, so this is someone who's had uh, three grafts. And I'm afraid the images are not great because the lights are too high, bright, but this is a left internal mammary graft coming to the left anterior center, it's a 3D reconstruction of the heart. And you can see that this graft is patent, and this is the reconstruction here, this is the left internal mammary artery, and this is a vein graft which is coming down, and if, you, if you're up the front here, you can see there's a stenosis here in this vein graft, and there's a little blob there, so that's a stump. So we can see that there's a, a patient who's had a bypass surgery, the internal mammary graft is open, there's a stump, and there's a stenosis in the vein graft. So again, you know, we can then say, well, this could be a cause of chest pain, and this could be something that we can intervene on as an interventional cardiologist. We can take this patient to the lab and probably just stent this straight away. So very, very important in graft evaluation and very important in planning intervention. But equally, uh, now what's also growing is the use of uh, CT coronary angiography and stent evaluation. It can be difficult because, as you can see in the bottom here, th these two slides here, these are stents here. This bright stuff is, is, is a stent sitting in the coronary angiogram. This is contrast and this is the stent. Now, if the stent is very dense or very small, it's impossible to see within the lumen, and that's a very big limitation of it. But for a, a stent which is uh, slightly larger, for example, three millimeters or greater, then we can visualize within the stent, and we can make an assessment about the patency of that stent, and we can also look at the runoff, which means the distal vessels as well. So they're very important to stent evaluation. And as I've said to you already, very important in terms of coronary calcification. In this, in this middle slide here, all this white, bright white stuff, this is all calcium. So this is someone who's got severe calcific coronary disease. And as you can see, the problem here is when you see something like this, a great big white chunk there, it can be impossible to look within the lumen. And that is a severe limitation of CT coronary angiography, which it, which it will change in the future. But at the moment, we cannot look within this coronary artery here for some of these patients like this and we will need to do a coronary angiogram which confirms that there is a distal left main stem stenosis but that doesn't look as bad as when you see that sort of picture. So at the moment, severe diffuse coronary calcification is a limitation to visualising the lumen but it does tell you that there's a severe plaque burden and that in itself tells you that the event rate is higher in that patient in the future. Another limitation of a CT coronary angiogram is someone who's got a fast heart rate or patients who have arrhythmias. Uh, which are uncontrolled. That can be a problem because we just get artifact and it's impossible to see what it looks like. So therefore, when we're doing our uh, CT coronary angiograms, part of our protocol is to try to make sure the heart rate is well controlled. 
So we do give a lot of beta blockers. But at this point, if you do have a patient whose heart rate is uncontrolled, then, then an invasive coronary angiogram may be better to look at the lumen. So a couple of case examples now, just to uh, come to the end of this part. Um, so this is a patient who's had a stent in the left anterior descending and has further chest pain six months after the stent. And uh, this is a CT coronary angiogram. So at the bottom, these are 3D reconstructions. And these are the reconstructions of the lumen. And what you can see here, this is the stent in the left anterior descending, which is open. And we have a stenosis in the right coronary artery. And the, th the interesting thing about this stenosis in the right coronary artery is there is no bright calcium there. This is soft plaque. So this is a lipid-rich plaque. So that's important because that would, mean, that would tell me that this is more likely to be amenable to intervention, for example, to stent this artery. I would say this is more likely to be successful because I think having calcium is actually uh, more likely to be an adverse sign uh, of uh, um, um, not being that successful with your uh, invasive procedure, your stenting procedure. So very useful at plaque characterization and again very useful at planning your interventional procedure in this sort of patient. This is an interesting patient of mine who had uh, been referred because he'd had a CT calcium score as part of a research study because he'd had an abnormal ECG. So the calcium score was very high, it's 1500. And uh, he came to me and he said, well doctor, I'm very well. I can cycle for five miles and I'm, I'm very well indeed. But I'm worried because this calcium score has come up, it's 1500, isn't that high? And so he says, yes, it's very high. So the next step we discussed is what, what should we do? Now if it was part of NICE guidelines, then he should, he should proceed on to um, an invasive angiogram, but he has no symptoms. So nice guidelines and chest, those nice guidelines and chest pain guidelines don't really apply here. So the trouble is, <coughs> if you look at the CT calcium score, it's every vessel. It's left main, left anterior descending, proximal right coronary artery. So the worry, worrying thing there for me is that you could be sitting on someone who's got prognostic disease, and that is what you don't want to miss in someone who's asymptomatic. Are you sitting on someone who's got a left main stem with proximal three vessel disease? And that's why I think it's important that you do investigate these people because you can then actually do that person a favour by doing further tests to look at either for ischemia or to look at prognostic disease. And they may require revascularization. So what this gentleman had was, um, uh, he had a CT angiogram as he didn't have any symptoms and he didn't want to proceed to uh, an invasive procedure. But I also went to stress echo to look at uh, whether there was any ischemia. And the stress echo showed no reversible ischemia. So that's one bit of reassuring information. And his CT coriangiogram is here. So this shows that he does have calcium in the proximal part of all three vessels. So this is the right coronary artery. But he has good uh, contrast to pacification in the distal vessels of the circumflex and of the left anterior descending with the stenosis here just after this calcium. This is the left anterior descending. So in fact, this gentleman has been well over the last two years with no problems and just on medical therapy. Uh, aspirin, statin, no beta blocker because he cycles, still cycles five miles a day. Um, but he knows that he's got coronary disease and he knows that he needs to uh, pay attention to lifestyle and his cholesterol and his risk factors. So this is another key way of using uh, cardiac CT in our daily practice. So in summary for this part, uh, CT coronary angiography has an important role in evaluation of chest pain and the NICE guidelines. Key strengths are exclusion of coronary disease, identification of multivessel coronary disease and calcium in particular, graft evaluation, stent evaluation, but there are some disadvantages, particularly there's a radiation dose and we're heart rate dependent, uh, so if you have a fast heart rate, we must try and control that, and that can be impossible in, in some patients. That last case that you mentioned, you had a high CT score, what was the indication for having a first So as part of that, as I said, he, was, he, was, he volunteered as part of a research study, and he had an ECG done as part of that, which was abnormal. And part of that study was to have a calcium score, and the calcium score flagged up very high. So completely asymptomatic. Oops, completely asymptomatic. But he volunteered himself as part of research, and this is uh, something that does happen frequently in research studies. You pick up things, and sometimes it's difficult to know should you act on it or not, because it's a research study. There is no evidence of that. So, uh, but we have to act on it and uh, take it forward, which we've done in that case. Now I'll probably save questions and go on to the next part of the talk. So the next part is, is, is briefer and I'm going to talk about um, what does um, CT coronary angiography, cardiac CT, tell us about prognosis and outcome. I want to talk about plaque characterization and is that important and what do the latest generation of scanners uh, do and help with uh, plaque characterization and how is that useful in our patient's practice 
and also the latest and newest things for Card XCT in the future. Where are we going with Card XCT and, and what's that going to uh, bring for the future? So the first thing about um, uh, CT coronary angiography, card CT, as I've said to you, it's very good at ruling out coronary disease. So the negative predictive value is, is very high, which means you know, if we see someone who's got no coronary disease, as I showed you in the first slides, then we can say, you know, absolutely fine, your event rate is going to be low, don't worry about things. Okay, so it's very good at doing that. And there's lots of studies now showing that. However, most of this talk I've been talking to you about stable patients. We do now have new data, emerging data, on acute patients with CT coronary angiography, and this is from the New England Journal of Medicine last year, patients presenting to the emergency department with acute coronary syndromes. This is over a thousand patients who are randomized to CT or standard of care. It's an American study, so the standard of care there does include myocardial perfusion scanning, but at least in this study, of the patients who had a CT coronary angiogram uh, and it was negative, so we could rule out coronary disease, they had no event rate at 30, day, 30 days, so 0% rate of death in MI. So this is important because we need to see these sorts of studies in high quality research papers to help us if we're going to expand the remit of cardiac CT. And it is expanding into now uh, more patients with acute coronary syndromes. And definitely in our practice uh, at Ealing, we are using uh, it now uh, more and more in some of our patients <coughs> who are not suitable for invasive coronary angiography. So we do now have a lot of data to, to tell us that um, the event rate is close to zero if you have patients who have got no calcium and no coronary stenosis uh, as determined by cardiac CT, like this patient on the side, <coughs> smooth, smooth coronary arteries, a smooth coronary artery there. Uh, and we have that data now, a whole load of uh, studies in stable chest pain and now acute chest pain, definitely in the last year from that New England Journal paper. We also now have interesting disease which parallels the data from invasive coronary angiography that if we can go a little bit further, not just identify that there's presence or absence of disease, but the nature of the disease. So whether it's one, two, three vessel disease, or whether it involves a left main. Now that we have this data for invasive angiography, and up until very recently, up until last year, from 2011, 2012, uh, we didn't have that data, but now we do. And this is data from a German registry, over 15,000 patients, looking at a probability of event rate if by CT, uh, you have normal coronaries, non-obstructive, one, two, or three vessel or left main disease. And you can see that the probability of MACE uh, is, um, is worse, basically, if you have three vessel or left main disease. So that's important. So that means that when we're reporting that there's a moderate to severe stenosis on the coronary angiogram, uh, we do now have data to say that those patients are actually going to be at a higher risk for the future. Um, and this is now very uh, important to help expand the role of cardiac CT in evaluating patients with coronary disease. So very interestingly and um, very recently now, we are now finding out and discovering that it's not just knowing that the, there is uh, coronary disease in one, two or three vessels, but also the nature of that disease. Clark characterization is becoming very important. And that's important because that may help us to identify whether patients may be at risk of developing an acute event or acute coronary syndrome in the near future. Now, this is very important because it's, it's really only the latest generations of scanners, like we have here at the Sion and also at Ealing, which are able to characterize plaque very well. And I'm just going to talk you through what I mean by that. So what, what we're able to do, what we normally do, is we can show calcium. And I've talked a lot about calcium and calcium scoring. And that just looks like this on the right here, bright, white, chalky, lumpy bits of calcium. But more than that, we can now look at patients who don't have any calcium at all on the left-hand side, if you're looking at it. This is a plaque sitting here. As you can see here, this sort of uh, bite out of this vessel here, this is contrast in the vessel. So this is, would be classified as a non-calcified plaque. This is basically uh, a fibroatheroma lipid is more likely to be within this plaque. And there's a, a second group of plaques which have a combination of both mixed plaques, we would call them, a bit of calcium and some lipid as well. So we would call these mixed plaques. So this is how we're able now to characterize plaques very well. The key strength and advantage of cardiac CT here is that over invasive coronary angiography because you cannot do this with an invasive luminogram. You have to do something else like an intravascular imaging modality like IVOS or OCT. So this is where cardiac CT now has, I would say, a strength above an invasive angiogram is that we're able to look at plaque characterization much more uh, detail. And this is where cardiac CT is going to grow in the future. Why this is important is because we now have data emerging that, for example, in patients with acute coronary syndromes, as on this graph here on the left, we are more likely to see people who have 
uh, lipid-laden plaques, which are positively re remodeled. Uh, and as you can see on this side here, positive remodeling means we can see the plaque actually bulging out here. There is no calcium here, as I showed you before. So this is a lipid-rich plaque, and it's impinging on the lumen. So in patients with acute coronary syndromes, we are more likely to see this sort of plaque. And this sort of plaque is now becoming identified as a higher risk plaque for these sorts of patients. And we also now have the data that uh, this leads to an adverse events rate if you have two of these features. So that's a lipid, uh, a low attenuation, so basically no calcium, and positively remodeled vessel, the event rate is worse in this group of patients with acute coronary syndromes. We also now have even more detail than that, and if you just look at this image here uh, on the uh, center of the screen, this is um, another image which is being identified, which we're, which we're identifying as, um, again, a lipid-rich plaque. So this is uh, what is called a thin cap fibroatheroma. Now, we have seen these with various imaging modalities, which is lipid, with a very thin cap. Now, these are the plaques which we think are likely to rupture, but we are now able to identify these on CT. Now this is um, a, a right coronary artery, and this is a section of this tight stenosis here. So this is the lumen, but outside this lumen, you can see this vessel, this is all the vessel. This is a positively remodeled vessel. So we have a cap here, there's a thin cap here towards the lumen, and there's this dark area here. Now this dark area is lipid, and this is what would be characteristic of a thin cap fibroatheroma. And we now think, and evidence is growing here, that it's this sort of plaque which is more likely to rupture and it's this sort of plaque which is more likely to lead to an acute coronary syndrome. So you can see here that it's impossible to say that by doing an angiogram. And I think this is where CT coronary angiography is going to have a key strength in the future, because not only will we, will we be able to identify disease, disease in numbers of vessels, we know that's related to prognosis, now we can also identify the characteristic of that plaque, and that will also, I'm sure, have a bearing on prognosis and outcome for the future. So this is a very important area of CT coronary angiography for the future. So, what else does the future hold? This is the last part of the talk which I'm going to talk about. And this is something that we're developing here at Sion. The future is, uh, I think, something that could be uh, akin, which we'll, we'll talk more about in the next talk, and we may have a discussion about this. CT perfusion and ischemia imaging. This is something which is coming in the future, and this is something where there's been emerging data in the last year or two. And I'm just going to highlight uh, a couple of uh, areas of research on this. The standards of um, uh, ischemia imaging uh, in old data, if you look back, had been uh, perfusion scanning with uh, thallium or, or um, uh, uh, technetium, maybe scanning, and then stress echo, uh, which is important, which you'll hear a lot about uh, in a second. Um, so we now have data to show that actually CT perfusion imaging is becoming important and is possible and may have uh, uh, a role and may also be as accurate as nuclear medicine scanning from this paper which I've just picked out. And I'm just going to show you one of the cases in that paper. I won't go into it in too much detail. This is just to give you a flavor about where the future is. So this is a, a patient who had uh, a CT coronary angiogram and a myocardial perfusion uh, uh, scan, a th nuclear medicine scan. This is the CT coronary angiogram on the right here. So this is a, a circumflex vessel, which has got a stenosis here, a tight stenosis. And this is the nuclear medicine scan here. And the blue areas show lack of perfusion compared to the orangey ready areas, OK? And that is consistent with this lateral wall, infralateral wall. And so that will be consistent with this area. So that's the nucleus scan. In this patient, he went on to have a CT perfusion image. And unfortunately, the lights are not helping us here. But what we can see, the arrows over here showing lack of perfusion of the myocardium on this side, which is the infralateral wall, the lateral wall. And we can colorize that and have a look at that here on the wall motion uh, index here. And that can show us those areas of ischemia. So this is where. Uh, stress CT perfusion imaging is going into the future. Now, that's interesting and uh, important, but it's still growing and it still needs a lot of evidence base. It's still not completely established in clinical practice. Reason being is because you need to do a rest and a stress scan. So there's a double radiation dose, there's a double contrast dose, and that's a limitation at the moment. However, there are some patients where this is going to be important for, and we are developing this uh, at the Scion here. And these are, this is one of the scans which I've done here on one of our patients. I'm just going to talk you through this. This is a 48-year-old obese man who came in and was admitted with chest pain. He had an invasive angiogram which showed moderate disease in the left anterior descending vessel. Because he was so large, his echo images are not clear. It was very difficult to get any echo windows at all. So he was sent for a cardiac MRI scan. But unfortunately, this gentleman was very large, 
and he barely fitted into the MRI scanner, and he was too claustrophobic. He couldn't have the scan. So we had very little way, other than going back to the cath lab and doing an invasive test, to uh, look at, well, was this significant or not, this left anterior descending lesion. So, uh, 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 lesion. so we did a CT stress perfusion uh, scan. And this is just a, a flavor of what we're developing here. This is a, a cross-section of the heart. And uh, as I said to you before, the blue areas basically show lack of perfusion, low perfusion. And this is what this gentleman had. He had, with stress, he had a reduced perfusion in the septum. So this would indicate that uh, this uh, lesion in the left hand here is descending is significant. And in fact, he then went back to the cath lab and he went on to have that stented. So this is an area of the future. This is growing. Uh, it, it will come into clinical practice for selected patients that I've shown you. And I think those selected patients will be where other modalities um, cannot help. For example, if there's uh, inadequate echo windows, inadequate echo images, or patients are not able to have scans for other reasons, then this may be an area which we can use for the future. So I'd like to finish there just with this and to say that for the future as an interventional cardiologist, I will be doing less diagnostic coronary angiography, I think, but I'll be doing more intervention, which is planned and guided by the uh, CT coronary angiogram. Thank you very much.